Okay, thank you all for coming out tonight and coming out for this weekend. Uh, it's always an exciting weekend, uh, wild week, and then we get here and see all you here. It's just a, it's very refreshing. It's very fun. Uh, so thank you for coming. My name is uh, Matt Moeller. I'm uh, the director of the symposium, and I'm a theology professor here at Benedictine College. Uh, and I'm just saying welcome, greeting you here, um, and uh, I'll thank people at the end, but also just want to thank everybody who's uh, helped put this put this show on. Uh, there's an army of people making all this happen, right? and so I appreciate uh, all the work people have done. Um, and I hope you enjoy your time here with us. Uh, we try to make the symposium uh, a time of great intellectual discussion, but also a time of fellowship, uh, prayer, and uh, just a great experience of Benedictine hospitality. So uh, I hope you experience that here. Um, and just a couple things I want to point out um, related to. Uh, the theme of the conference this year, every year we have, uh, this year's theme, as you know, is uh, proclaiming the real presence, and we're doing this as part of a participation in the Eucharistic revival going on. But every year at the symposium, we have Eucharistic adoration, and this year, down the hall, on the last the last room on the left, uh, we'll have Eucharistic adoration. Start. It's happening now, it goes till 10 o'clock, and then tomorrow morning, 8 until about 5 o'clock, adoration is present at the symposium. Um, we have vendors that will be set up on that wall over there. Uh, and Saturday evening, our local Catholic bookstore, Pache Abene, will be coming and setting up books uh, from our presenters and other uh, great Catholic uh, works and, and merchandise from their store. So they'll be here. So save your money, right? Uh, be ready to spend on Saturday evening uh, after Mass. Um, and we're also, some of our students, if, for our visitors who have, uh, this is your first time at Benedictine, uh, some of our students will be offering campus tours at lunch tomorrow. So after you get your food, you can run on and do a tour of campus if you'd like, um, and that's available to you. But I just want to say welcome um, and get this uh, conference started by inviting Father Jay to uh, open us in prayer. First of all, on behalf of the monks of St. Benedict's Abbey and Abbot James Albers, I welcome all of you to the, to, to the symposium. Uh, my name is Father Jay. I am the sub-prior in our community. Uh, being a convert and the Eucharist being an important part of my conversion, this, uh, this symposium is a great joy for me to be here with all of you. So let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for the great gift you have given us and this bread from heaven, the, this manna, the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for this tremendous gift that is beautiful in itself, that is filled with your lo merciful love, that is filled with your presence. We ask, Lord, that you may fill us with your presence at the symposium, that you are present here with us, inspiring us and drawing us closer and closer to our eternal homeland. Lord, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us, upon all the speakers and presenters. Give us hearts that are open and receptive, as they are always open and receptive to you at every Mass and every opportunity for adoration when we receive you into our souls. Bless us and guide us always on your holy way, and never let us stray. For we make our prayers through Christ our Lord. Our Lady of Divine Providence, St. Benedict, pray for us. And one year ago, we prayed a consecration prayer to Our, Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And so let us pray the Memorare together. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left and aided. Inspired by this confidence, fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother, Thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Welcome to the 12th Annual Symposium on Transforming Culture. Okay, Matt, that was 
first, right? <laughs> As we do first. Okay, so welcome. I'm Steve Bracci of the English department here, and I will be emceeing two thirds of this. Not tomorrow morning, because I will be doing this charity thing tomorrow morning. So, no tomorrow morning. You can rejoice in getting a break from the hyperactive Marachi experience. That's right. All right, so we've already heard about adoration, correct? Right? Okay, and we've already heard about that. So, let me get right to it then and introduce our keynote speaker, Francis X. Mayer. Francis X. Mayer is a senior fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. His work focuses on the intersection of Christian faith, culture, and public life with special attention to lay formation and action. Mr. Mayer served as senior advisor and special assistant to Archbishop Chapu for 23 years in Denver and Philadelphia. He previously served as editor-in-chief of the National Catholic Register News Weekly and as a story analyst and screenwriter based in Los Angeles. A graduate of the University of Notre Dame and NYU's School of the Arts, he is a former fellow of the American Film Institute's Conservatory for Advanced Film Studies. He is a co-founding board member of the University of Pennsylvania's Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture and a board member of the Napa Institute. That is the official introduction. Here at the symposium, we have a tradition of giving a slightly less formal slightly roasty presentation afterwards. This is where, for instance, because I have friends on Facebook who are friends with Francis X. Mayer, I send messages to them and I say things like, the X stands for DMX, doesn't it? And they're like, no, it does not stand for DMX. I'm like, yes, it does. As many of you know firsthand, the Catholic media sphere can be a very scary place. Francis X. Mayer's approach is fairly simple. He writes with the rhetorical style and wit of a classically trained oratorian, yet he spouts truth with a capital T and takes no prisoners. Just last week, for instance, he published a piece called Enough is Enough at The Catholic Thing, which many of you might know because of Robert Royal and others. In that story, he addressed a Washington Post story that was attempting to discredit the work of Catholic laity and clergy for renewal. You all remember that's the group that did all the studies about priests using Grindr, right? So the Washington Post were trying to discredit that group. Meyer was having, Mayer, excuse me, was having none of it. In his story, he took down the Washington Post in six pithy points, and he saved the quiet part for last. Quote, the overwhelming majority of abusers in the clergy abuse scandal were homosexual men. Illicit homosexual behavior in the priesthood has no claim to privacy, nor moral integrity, end quote. Or, in a book review published just a few days ago at First Things, Mayer heartily recommends Mary Eberstadt's latest book, Adam and Eve After the Pill Revisited. Recounting a bit of his own family history, Mayer once again says what much of our culture would rather not hear, quote, the absence of fathers and father figures in our current culture is one of the worst costs of the sexual revolution. And as Eberstadt shows very powerfully, the social repercussions have been catastrophic." End quote. So as you can imagine, when you're someone like Francis X. Mayer, you make some powerful fans. None other than the great Father Z. Yes, I see from the smiles, I see some people who, have, who visit the website frequently. Yes, this is John Zulsdorf of What Does the Prayer Really Say fame. Yes, we have some head nods. Mm-hmm. So, the outspoken enigmatic traditionalist priest shared on his very popular blog, Meyer's Analysis of the Metaphysical Vacuity of Catholic Progressivism. Father Z commented simply in one word at the end of his post, quote, genius, unquote which as you know is very unorthodox for Father Z, who is usually quite verbose and usually quite critical. <laughs> he generally does not give praise lightly. So when you've got Father Z as a fan, you know you are doing something right. Now, when you're someone like Francis X. Mayer, you make some enemies. About three years ago, Mike Lewis, one of the founders of the not quite as popular blog Where Peter Is, took Mayer to task for, guess what? Criticizing Pope Francis. Lewis called the climax of Meyer's piece that ran in National Review, quote, a regurgitated litany of condescending and stale talking points against the Holy Father's magisterium, 
magisterial teachings, excuse me. Mayor's assertions have been repeated and refuted since the beginning of this papacy, unquote. Hmm. What's Mike Lewis up to these days? Do some of you follow where Peter is? Do some of you follow this blog? Okay. Four days ago, he published a piece calling Archbishop Vigano, and I quote, a madman, a fugitive, and deeply troubled. Lewis then says, we probably should have been listening all along to three other bishops. Can you guess which three? Whirl, Tobin, and Supich. So, Mayor, with enemies like these, do we really need inquisitors? Hmm? But my, Mayor is also capable of writing with great humility. In early 2021, Mayor wrote about a project he was working on that involved interviewing more than 30 bishops. The article ends on this hopeful note. Quote, Families need fathers. The extraordinary fact of life in the United States is not the few bishops who humiliate us so bitterly, but the many who do the job so well." Unquote. So on a personal note, I would like to share just a small sample of the written correspondence that Francis X. Mayer and I have shared over the years. I'm hoping that the personality of these letters and the intimacy of it that comes with letter writing will show you a side of him that others don't often see. I have a bunch of our letters here, but I'll just choose one of these more recent ones. Dear Steve, he's so polite. Thank you for submitting again for the eighth straight year in a row, your abstract for the Ethics and Public Policy Center conference. He remembers me every year. I'm continually amazed at your uncanny ability to conjure new adjectives and fresh verbal expressions to synopsize what is essentially the exact same presentation you send us <laughs> every year. Concerning your highly specialized field of what might be called in some circles expertise. His quotation marks, not mine. Really cool. As we mentioned in the call for papers, we did not know if we could have a conference this year given the situation with the unknown virus of unspecified origin. I am delighted to tell you, however, that we will indeed have a conference. And I'm even more excited to tell you that it will be in person. Alas, you will not be among those presenting. <laughs> With great hopes of receiving yet again next year the self-same paragraph, you dutifully dress up in emperor's clothing in the hopes that somehow the law of self-contradiction will expire and turn no into yes. I remain your obedient servant. Francis X just gave it to you cold, mother of Meyer. <laughs> See, I didn't understand the DMX, now I do. One of the foremost theologians, journalists on the front lines today. Please welcome Francis X. Mayer. You know, if any. <laughs> If any of you believe any of that, I have a bridge for you. Um, I've got, a, I've got um, a couple of public service announcement, announcements and then a, a, a speaker's advisory. Uh, the, uh, the public, thank you very much, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I have seven of those, by the way, running around as grandkids at home, so they're very welcome. Uh, so, uh, the public announcements. Uh, you know, before, I'm going to mention uh, uh, at least one substack in my talk tonight, but I really want to emphasize it going into, uh, going into the evening. There is a wonderful, wonderful substack called uh, The Upheaval. It's done by N.S. Lyons, and I really, I really encourage you to look at it. It's some of the best social analysis I've ever read. No idea if the guy is Catholic or Christian. He seems to be religious. He never really reveals that, but his work is really terrific. Another one is Paul Kingsnorth's uh, substack uh, called The Abbey of Misrule. Uh, Kingsnorth is a really interesting thinker because he, uh, he was an atheist and he was, he was very active environmentalist, uh, went through Buddhism and Wicca for a while, and ended up about a year and a half ago 
converting to Christianity and entering the Orthodox Church. He has a wonderful, I mean, a fantastic article called Wild Christianity in, uh, I think, last month's first thing that I'd highly recommend. And the final public announcement is there's a new uh, substack called What We Need Now that I highly recommend. It just opened this week. Uh, there's an article in there on very tata splendor and the importance of stable, a stable sense of truth that uh, was written by Archbishop Shapu. It's very, very good. Um, the, the author, the right, pardon me, the speaker's advisory is that I, I need you to know that I identify as a 24-year-old uh, handsome, articulate Irish guy. Uh, so <clears throat> if you're fooled by the fact that I'm actually, or appear to be, a 74-year-old German crank with glasses and a memory loss, um, the real me isn't responsible for what you hear tonight. So having said that, uh, let's get down to business. Before we get started, I need to thank uh, Dr. Muller uh, for inviting me here tonight and President Minnis for his exceptional academic leadership. Places like, and I mean this sincerely, places like Benedictine are treasures. Uh, they're important, vastly out of proportion to their size. And I'll talk about why that is toward the end of my comments. In the meantime, though, I'm the warm-up act for the really good stuff happening tomorrow, so I want to begin with a story. I've told this story before, but I think it's especially useful, <clears throat> pardon me, for our time together tonight. I served on diocesan staffs for 27 years, including 23 as senior aide to a bishop. And there was a morning some years ago when I found a little gift from a friend on my desk when I got to the office. It's a wooden plaque uh, about seven inches wide, and on it, burned into the wood with a branding iron, are the words, uh, it is as bad as you think, and they are out to get you. <laughs> the friend who gave it to me is a Capuchin Francisco, a Franciscan by the name of Charles Chapu, who also happened to be my boss and the Archbishop first of Denver and then of Philadelphia. And that gift tells you two things about the man. Uh, number one, he has a healthy, if impish, sense of humor. And number two, he's a stone-cold realist. Tranquility in the church is a rare and beautiful thing with an emphasis on that word rare. And this explains why the archbishop's two favorite saints are Francis of Assisi and Augustine of Hippo. Both men lived at a time of bitter conflict within the church and turmoil in the surrounding culture. Neither man was weak or naive, and as any good Capuchin will tell you, Francis was very far, very far, from the effeminized flower child of popular imagination. He was a formidable man and a demanding religious founder with an intense devotion to the Eucharist. And Augustine was a faithful shepherd to his people in a world of pervasive heresy, a bishop not just with a brilliant intellect, but also with the backbone to speak and fight for the truth which he did vigorously throughout his ministry. And that brings us to a paradox. The church is our mater et magistra, our mother and teacher, the source of our solace. She exists to transform the world through the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And history shows that on the balance, she's done a pretty good job of it. The church is and always has been loaded with unknown everyday saints, some of them here tonight in this room, and a great many other good people trying to be saints. And yet right alongside them in the church is an energetic minority of hypocrites, frauds, and screw-ups. In the real world, the church is peopled and led by human beings. And humans are creatures with flaws, which explains why priests of the great 16th century reforming bishop, St. Charles Borromeo, tried to assassinate him twice. It explains why St. Athanasius, the early church father, traveled with armed bodyguards to avoid being whacked by his heretical opponents. It explains why bishops at some of the early church councils settled their differences with bricks and bats. And yet here we are 20 centuries later, still yearning for something more than this world, still praising Jesus Christ, still believing in the church and her mission. Something sustains and ennobles the church over the terrain of hard centuries, despite the world's and our own best efforts at ruining her. 
And that something is a loving God who never has and never will abandon his bride. So here's the point. When we look to the future as Christians, there is good news and bad news. C.S. Lewis described Christianity as a fighting religion. And he did it for a reason. There's evil in the world and evil in our own hearts. The process of conversion involves unavoidable conflict. But the good news is good news. And in the end, the good news heavily outweighs the bad. There are too many reasons for hope and confidence, too many sources of gratitude and joy to ever justify despair. Whenever I get in the dumps, I reread the letters of St. Paul. He's a guy who was rejected, beaten, jailed, run out of town again and again by angry mobs, but he never lost confidence or joy in Jesus Christ. And that's because he loved him and that's because he knew him. And with just those two weapons, the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, he reset the course of the world. Now that happened once, and it can happen again, starting right here and right now with each of you. Of course, the bad news is still bad, and bad news does serve a purpose. It's medicinal like a cold shower for drunks. It gets our attention. It suggests that maybe we need to sober up and start thinking and acting differently. So I want to focus for the rest of these brief comments on three very simple things. First, where we are now as a church in the United States. Second, how and why we got there. And third, and much more happily, what we can do about it. So regarding item number one, where we are now. Excuse me one second. Where we are now. Most of us here tonight already know that the church in this country now operates in a very complicated environment. Government is increasingly unfriendly. Much of the media establishment is hostile. The clergy abuse scandal hurt many good people and damage church credibility. Catholic anthropology and sexual morality, which undergird the whole biblical understanding of who and what a human being is, are often seen as a form of bigotry. Baptisms, sacramental marriages, and church attendance are generally down. As money as one in three priests nominated for the episcopate now decline the ministry because of the burdens and criticism that come with the job. Now that's the 30,000 foot view. But if you're a person like me, somebody who enjoys a good wallow in anxiety and wants a more granular understanding of why today's culture is becoming so tough for people of faith, then here's a perfect homework assignment. When you get home tonight, Google the name N.S. Lyons on the internet and then go to his Substack site, The Upheaval. Then read his article, no, the revolution isn't over. I have no idea if Lyons is personally religious, but his site, The Upheaval, is one of the best sources of social analysis you'll ever read, and his data are sobering. As Lyon notes in detail, we're living through a multi-generational sea change in beliefs and values. It has enormous momentum, it won't be easily reversed, and it's causing both ambiguity and division within church leadership, and a sense of confusion and powerlessness among individual believers, or at least those individual believers who are paying attention. In effect, the country I grew up in, I'm 74, that other me uh, is 74 anyway, uh, I grew up in really no longer exists. Morlocks are running the theme park and eating the guests, and there's no quick fix to the problems we behaved ourselves into. Here's an example. In the boomer generation, my generation, roughly 65% of my age cohort expressed a strong belief in God as late as 1988. And boomer belief stayed pretty steady over the next four decades through 2018. So 65% in my cohort. 
For Generation Z, in other words, young people between 11 and 26, barely 30% express a strong belief in God. And that generation will be running the country for the next 25 to 50 years. It doesn't take an Einstein to figure out the implications because it's hard to see the value of religious freedom if you're not religious, especially if you've been trained to think of religious faith as a delusion or an excuse for bigotry. So let's move on to item number two, how and why we got here. You know, in the wake of a uh, clergy abuse scandal, it's tempting to blame our bishops for just about everything wrong with the church. That would be very convenient. It would also be wrong. I'll say more about bishops shortly, but in the meantime, we should realize that the main factors now rewiring our culture come from outside the church, and they're beyond any religious leader's control. I'm a father of four and the grandfather of 11, so I'm angry about the clergy abuse scandal. I dealt with its human damage for more than half of my diocesan career. But I'd be a fool to think that weird and wicked sex is somehow uniquely Catholic, because it's not. We live in a hypersexualized society. It impacts everybody and everything, and the church is not immune. We now have a culture as soaked in hardcore pornography as the Roman writer Petronius described in his satiricon stories of the first century AD. And while we're on the subject of Rome, it's the distinguished historian Tom Holland, not some right-wing alarmist, who draws parallels between the end of the Roman Republic and the condition of our Western democracies today. Whatever America once was, and to some extent still is, it's also an empire with global interests, increasing class divisions, and a massive, frankly obscene, concentration of wealth in its leadership elites. Empires are big, and bigness, as the economist Leopold Kor wrote in The Breakdown of Nations, is a problem, it's a big problem. The machinery of empires is remote from the beliefs and concerns of the people they claim to serve. In practice, majority opinion doesn't matter. Elite opinion does. Now, given the last three years, that should be fairly obvious. There are exceptions, of course, but there are exceptions, not the rule. There's one more key external factor that shapes our current circumstances. The movable type press was invented to print the Bible, and it did that really well. Another thing it did really well was fuel the Reformation and 150 years of propaganda, bloodshed, division, and political turmoil in Europe before a new equilibrium was reached. That was the effect of just one technological advance. The tech world today is permanently fluid. The nature, number, and speed of today's technological changes dwarf anything in human experience. And that creates emotional turbulence, and it has a nonstop, unsettling effect on society at large and the individual human psyche in particular. Simply to stay sane, we need to somehow restore a sense of permanence and transcendent meaning in minds that are baked to a crisp by artificial intelligence, information overload, and virtual reality fantasy. Now that seems like a natural task for the church. So why hasn't the church done better in her response? Well, there are lots of reasons. We might start by blaming two generations of really crummy catechesis since Vatican II, or maybe the absence of beauty in our worship. When young people run to the old Latin mass, two of the things they're running away from are mediocrity and ugliness in mainstream Catholic liturgy and preaching. And kindly note, I am not a fan of the old Latin mass. I grew up with it. And uh, yes, it had moments of marvelous beauty. And I can remember them from my years of serving as an altar boy. But it could also be just as mind numbing as some of the liturgies we have now. The point is, beauty inspires. The lack of it repels. And the church in too many of our parishes has too little compelling beauty, too little reason to love the church as our mother. 
And of course, that raises deeper questions about the faith of the people who produce and the faith of the people who settle for a life of worship without beauty. There are three other internal factors I need to briefly note in explaining our circumstances. The church is a very big ship. She turns slowly. That's a strength, but it's also a weakness. She's also not structured to adapt quickly to rapid change. We American Catholics also cling to the delusion that the church is a valued partner in addressing the nation's key issues of public concern. She should be, she once was, but increasingly she's not. And finally, our Catholic parents and grandparents worked very hard for many decades to prove their patriotism, to join the American dream, and to make a material success of their lives. And they succeeded. They succeeded so well that many of us today are indistinguishable from everyone else in our customs and convictions, including those people who reject everything about the religion that we claim to follow. To put it very simply, we've forgotten who we are, what our baptism actually means, and what a genuinely Catholic life invites and requires. Now, at this point, some of you in the audience are no doubt wondering where all that good news happened to be. Uh, so let's move along to item three, what we can do now, what we need to do now. You know, I'm in the last months of finishing a book on life in the church. I've been working on it for the past two and a half years. And in the process, I've interviewed at length more than 100 lay people, clergy, and religious all over the country. That included 30 bishops from 25 states, all but one of them interviewed anonymously so they could speak frankly. And they did speak frankly, sometimes very frankly. Too frankly to mention here, by the way. Uh, but uh, there's been too much to share from those conversations in the time remaining to us tonight. There are a few things, however, that I do need to pass along. First, if we call ourselves Christians, we need to stop thinking and acting like embarrassed losers. Jesus Christ has already done the hard work. I sometimes wonder if there's a unique Catholic charism for whining. We have a gift, a really highly developed gift, uh, for defeating ourselves. Bad news is only terminal if we accept it as the last word. The one thing history proves again and again is that the Christian church is very, very good at the long game and the long war. But she does need us to wake up and own our mission, own our discipleship. Second, while we're on the subject of history, we need to remember a lot more of it. History is the memory of a people. A person without memory is a person without identity and therefore without purpose. The same applies to churches, nations, and cultures. The Jewish people have survived millennia of consistent persecution because they relentlessly remember who they are. Americans, on the other hand, are chronically bad at history because we just don't like it. We don't like it because we tend to see it as a burden, a mortgage on our future, an obstacle to, a, to our ability to constantly reinvent ourselves. But for American Catholics, that attitude is toxic. We're part of an ongoing salvific narrative that stretches back 2,000 years. And we need to own that. We need to treasure that. One of the best books I've read in the last decade is Hubert Jadine's Great History of the Council of Trent. It's the story of the 125 years of church stupidity, corruption, bumbling, and indifference that led up to Martin Luther. But it's also the story of the great Tridentine reform, the renewal of Catholic life, and the massive rebirth and explosion of Catholic missionary zeal. History, in fact, always teaches us two things. Humility, because we have an extraordinary genius for screwing things up, and hope, because even at our worst, God never abandons his people. Third, the bishops I interviewed had different skills, different personalities, and very different diocesan situations. Some were urban, some were rural, some financially sound, 
some uh, poor and struggling. But they were all of them, every single one of them, good men committed to their people. We need to love and respect our bishops because the work they do really is all-consuming. I saw it every day for 23 years. The habit of blaming our frustrations on bishops and priests is self-defeating. It's also a weird kind of clericalism because it gets us laity off the hook. As Pope Benedict said, we lay people are fully co-responsible for the church. Every bit as responsible as the clergy, and we need to act accordingly. Now that doesn't preclude legitimate criticism of our leaders. Anger, as the archbishop always told me, is not always a sin. Sometimes it's highly appropriate. And we have a duty to speak the truth. Christian fidelity and obedience are fundamentally different from, from, pardon me, from servility. Any happily married couple can tell you that. My lovely bride, Sue Anna, 52 years, has no trouble at all helping me see my defects with exquisite clarity. But it's hard to convert the guy next door, much less the world, if we're busy demeaning the men who lead us. Fourth, all Christian activism, projects, and ministry fail. They inevitably fail, unless they're rooted in contemplation. One of the priests I spoke with for my book runs, of the, runs the parish reconfiguration and right-sizing effort for a major, major urban diocese back east. That kind of job is pretty well replicates the worst of purgatory, by the way. Uh, he deals with buildings, budgets, real estate uh, agents, canon lawyers, civil lawyers, unhappy parishioners, and upset pastors nearly every day. I asked him what two things he would name to start a fundamental renewal across the board in Catholic life. His answer, and he didn't hesitate for a nanosecond, was personal confession and Eucharistic adoration. Both involve intimacy with the Lord, mostly in silence. Without intimacy, everything else in Christian life is empty noise. Fifth, I once asked Mike Sabanko, who's a family friend and a permanent deacon, what he thought the church would look like in 20 years. His answer was interesting. He said he didn't know, and he didn't spend much time worrying about it. You see, Mike is an ex-cop, a former New York City police lieutenant. Every day for more than two decades, he would show up at his desk and ask himself, and I'm quoting directly from, from our interview here, what's the mission, what's my purpose, what can I learn from the past without repeating it, and what can I do today to improve the future? We have limited influence on the future, which in any case doesn't yet exist. But we have a lot of influence on the choices we make and the actions we take here and now. Now matters. It matters because all the nows in a lifetime accumulate into the kind of people we become and the kind of world we help heal and rebuild or degrade and deface. The power of the powerless, to borrow a thought from the great Czech dissident uh, Václav Havel, lies in what we do now, in our willingness to speak and live the truth today, now, whatever the cost. It lies in our refusal to cooperate with a culture of distortion and deceit, whether it be in the Stalinism of Havel's time or that soul-murdering gender theory of today. Sixth and finally, I said earlier that Benedictine College is a treasure. What I mean is this. In my research over the past couple of years, I've come across dozens of extraordinary Catholic men and women. Despite all of today's anxiety about the future, the church has an enormously deep well of talent and apostolates that do astonishing work. The Augustine Institute, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, Catholic Leadership Institute, the Leonine Forum, the Napa Institute, good seminaries, and so many others. But leaders are formed by the quality of their education and mentors. And so many of today's higher, uh, higher institutions of Catholic learning have lost two key ingredients from their purpose, zeal and courage. Benedictine is different. This college has kept the faith which makes it so fruitful and such a pleasure and privilege for speakers to be here this weekend. It's like being washed up by a typhoon on a resort beach in Tahiti. <laughs> okay, maybe not quite, but you get the idea. 
So here's my parting thought. The overarching theme of these annual Benedictine symposia is the transformation of culture. And that reminds me of some words, pardon me one second. That reminds me of some words from my favorite Chinese theologian, Mao Zedong. Yes, it's true, Mao was a mass murderer and hideous excuse for a human being, nobody's perfect. Uh, <laughs> But even very wicked men can have very shrewd strategic thinking. And given his behavior, it seems only right to steal from him. <laughs> Mao, uh, Mao wrote an essay in 1938 with the title On Protracted War. And in it he said, weapons are an important factor in war, but not, but not the decisive factor. It is people, not things, that are decisive. Christians, as C.S. Lewis wrote, belong to a fighting religion, a religion engaged in a nonviolent struggle for the, for the conversion of the world, the soul of the world. Our weapons are faith, hope, and charity, justice, mercy, and courage. But all of those virtues are useless without the men and women to live and witness them because people, not things, are decisive. And Benedictine College excels at forming exactly the kind of people, the kind of leaders the church needs for today and into the future. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said that it's, uh, and I'm quoting him here, it's only with gratitude that life becomes rich. He wrote those words in a letter from prison just months before he was hanged by the Third Reich. Gratitude is the beginning of joy. No matter what our circumstances, gratitude is the, meaning, is the beginning of joy. And of course, that's at the very heart of Catholic Christian life. That's what the word Eucharist means. It comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. It's a fitting word to close on because I'm thankful for your listening so patiently tonight. I'm thankful for the beauty and substance of this wonderful Benedictine place of learning. I'm thankful for the faith and friendship we share as Christians, and I'm especially thankful for God's gift of wine because now I can safely have a glass. Thank you very much. You know, at the end of these uh, events, I, I used to see this when I was uh, assisting the Archbishop. The really interesting thing about all this stuff is you can do all this work on, on preparing your remarks, but the interesting stuff is always the interaction with the audience, because great questions are asked, and you actually reveal who you are instead of who you would like to be and what you say in your comments. So I hope we have some good questions coming, because I welcome them. Mm, okay, so I will come around with the microphone. Excuse me. Um, thank you for, for your words tonight. I'm, I'm Brother Jean-Marie, I'm one of the monks of the Abbey. Uh, I was certainly ed edified uh, by some of the things that you, you shared with us this evening. I uh, just wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, your work with Archbishop Chaput. You mentioned mm -hmm. your, your time serving with him. Um, yeah, what did you learn from him? What was that like to work with him? Oh, it was, it was a fantastic experience. I never expected it. But he was that kind of a guy. I mean, um, I could go on for about three hours. I don't think we have that much time. But, but one of, the, one of the things that he really believed in was cooperation with the laity. Now, uh, when you were, I mean, there was only one bishop, he was the boss, <laughs> and there was never any unclarity about that. But he had a real charism, a real ability to listen very carefully. Uh, he, he was not a top-down commander, you know? And Philadelphia, for example, had had that for a very, very long time, you know? But he, ex and I asked him once, you know, how do you, why is it that you operate the way that you do? And he said, well, Fran, you know, I was a provincial minister long before I was a bishop. And, a, and when you're a provincial minister, you may be the boss today, but six years from now you won't. And every other brother is gonna remember what you did to him, you know? <laughs> and, and so he's very, very careful to, make sh to force people to tell him the truth and not punish them if they did it honestly. And that, that was something that really, uh, I learned an enormous amount working for him because he had, he, he had a lot of skills that many people don't, I certainly don't. He, he had a, a real pastoral sense, but he was also a terrific administrator. He understood how to recruit good talent and allow them to do what they needed to do, 
but you always knew that he was going to circle back and find out whether you did what you said you were going to do, you know? And, and all these things came together in, in a package that was just very, very effective. And as I said, he had a really devilish sense of humor, you know? I, bishops don't typically show that very often, but in staff, I mean, he, would, he, would, he, he could be really very funny, you know? And, and, um, and that sense of humor and camaraderie that he built with the people that were reliable lieutenants around him just made it a joy to work for the guy. You know, I, I gave a talk about a, about a year ago, a private talk to bishops, and, and, I'll, and this is a true statement. I don't think there was anybody in the chancery. I mean, he, he was close to his brother priest, obviously. But in the chancery, I don't think there was anybody closer to him than I was because I, I worked with him very closely every day for like 23 years, you know. But I, I knew that if I lied to him, I would be out that day. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I said I never, I, I told the bishops that I never was entirely sure I had a job until I walked out on the last day of my employment. Because, because you, have to, you have to have people understand that they're going to be held accountable for their actions. You know, and, and he, was, he was very serious about that. He wasn't cruel. I never actually saw him lose his temper. I never actually saw him cruel to anybody. But... Um, you lied to him and you were dead, period. That's just the way it worked. He could forgive a lot, but dishonesty, never, you know? So that's a, I, that was one of the things that I learned, you know? Honesty, if you look at um, studies of leaders, <clears throat> honesty as a quality always, I think it always ends up in the top four, you know? There's another one, too, but people, even if, people will accept bad news if they hear it and they know it's, they're being told the truth, you know? And they may not like it, they'll adjust to it because they know where they told, they know they were told the truth. And if you add charity into the telling of the truth, then it makes it even more palatable. And he was able to do that. Um, so what did I learn? I had the experience of my lifetime. I never, I never started out thinking I was going to work for the church. I thought I was going to be a really terrific screenwriter. That didn't go much farther. You know, but, 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 but working for the church for me was great because I started working. You know, I started handling the National Catholic Register, but that's still sort of outside the machinery, you know? When I entered the machinery, I was gonna be there for a few years and get out, you know? And I, and I was really very nervous that it was going to make me um, be cynical about the church. It had precisely the opposite effect. In all the years that I worked for the church, I can probably list on one hand priests that I really didn't trust or really didn't like. I mean, they're good men. Just they're, they're guys like me, you know, they make a lot of mistakes, they stu do stupid things, you know, but, but they're good men who are trying to do their best. And the bishop's the same. They're, I mean, I, there are people that I think are losers. I mean, I have no idea what's going on in Supich's head or, or McElroy's, um, but they're really a minority in the, American pres in the American Episcopate. The American Episcopate is a healthy, faithful body of men trying to do the right thing. And frequently confused, like all of us are, because there's so much going on all the time, and it's just chaos. Which means that we all have to kind of go back to um, the basics and anchor ourselves in revelation. You know, John said, John Cavadini said something important tonight that the, the in, when we were talking privately, that there's a crisis in the church. Do people really believe in the revelation, or are they going to believe in social science? I mean, Cardinal Hollerick is being driven by social science when he talks about a anthropology. Do you believe in the Word of God or not? And, and that's critical. I'm sorry I'm talking too, too long, but uh, you asked a, an important question. I just wanted to give you a sense of it. Fran, you've been a father, <clears throat> and you've got now a grandfather seven times over. Mm -hmm. Is there any advice you'd give to your grandkids as they grow older that would be different than your own kids? Listen to me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you know, John, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is like, uh, it is really sometimes when you're talking to young people that you, you have all this stuff in your head and you know so much and you want to share it, but it's like talking through three inches of bulletproof glass, you know, I mean, it, it's, they, they just whoosh, don't hear you because, you know, we're old, we don't know what we're talking about, and, and, uh, and then they eventually grow, and if you're a good parent, they finally figure out that you were he actually had something to say, and, and, they'll, then, and they learn some stuff from it. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, think, the, I think you would re, you know, relate to this. I mean, our grandkids and our kids are the ble our blessings of our life. I mean, we've been married 52 years. 
which raises questions about Sue Ann's judgment. But, but, but it's been a great experience, you know? I mean, it's, I, I have to say this, excuse me for being this blunt, but you know, when we were talking, when John and I were talking, because we know each other from Denver, I think my wife's hot. You know, I mean, I really, I find her an attractive woman and, and full of life and, and uh, if I had quit or she had quit at 20 years, we wouldn't have any of that intimacy that you pay off at the end of your life, you know? I mean, people have this crazy idea that you go into your 50s and everything dries up. That's nuts. I mean, the 50s, 60s, 70s are pretty good too. I mean, the, 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 the intimacy in a marriage grows from the suffering that you go through, the things that you build together, the sacrifices that you make for each other. And, and um, again, that's like trying to communicate through three inches of bulletproof glass because nobody believes it until they live it. You know? I hope that wasn't too much of an answer, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the church. You know, I mean, moderate magistra. I, if, you th if, you, if you think of the church as a bureaucratic set of, of structures, you're dead. The church is a personal experience, a, a mother and a teacher. And all that administrative junk, you know, um, I know that there's a priest in the back that I know very well who's smiling as I'm talking because he's from Denver too and he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Structures die, you know, structures are necessary but they're suffocating if you let them become the, the substance of your life. Uh, it's, it's the church as this beauty, this beautiful uh, feminine presence moving through history that's just utterly fascinating. I mean, and, and so life-giving. Thank you for inspiring hope in the, our faith. That's and amazing, you know, Dave, because I'm a glass half empty guy. And, and uh, <laughs> if I've done that, I, I got some ter time off purgatory. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I, th I think your words did inspire hope tonight in, in, our, in our faith and in the future of the church and our church leaders. So thank you for those encouraging words. You talked about um, Americans' aversion to history yeah. and our struggle as American Catholics in that. And uh, part of um, uh, resurrecting history is telling it over and again in the art of storytelling. And, and telling maybe it truthfully. Can, telling it truthfully. Can you share how have you grown in your ability and your to tell stories well, and how we as academics and as up and coming leaders can be better storytellers? Boy, I don't know. Uh, the I don't I don't necessarily think I'm a good storyteller. I just like good stories. Of course, Jesus was the best storyteller of all with his par parables. But the fundamental truth is is that people respond to stories, and uh, much more powerfully than a, a, a data dump. You know. I mean, okay, so 65% of my, my boomer generation had a strong belief, 30% of um, Gen Z have a strong belief in God. That doesn't really mean anything, you know, in the sense that, I mean, it does mean something in the sense that it's a source of some anxiety and appropriate concern. But uh, on a personal level, people are always searching for meaning. And if you, if you convey that by sharing some of your own experiences, um, that, that has a really powerful effect. So you have, to have, you have to have the intellectual formation, you have to have the data available, but the way that you communicate that is just reaching into your, and reaching into your own experience and trying to blend that with the communication of the data, you know, and being humble about it. You know, when I talk about fathers, I had a great father, but, but um, we didn't get along. And you know, I, I just mentioned this in a piece, that, that piece that I wrote for about Mary Eberstadt's book this week. I mean, my dad, I didn't know that he had been unfaithful to my mother for years before I was born. He was an alcoholic. He had been unf serially unfaithful to my mother um, in the years before I was born. I mean, I, that I was born late in their marriage, relatively late in their marriage, but I never knew that. Why didn't I know that? Because my dad repented and changed and my mother had mercy on him. Now, I mean, I'm, you know, I can get emotional even thinking about that right now, but, but sharing that with somebody enables, if you do it properly, okay, in a way that's not intrusive or, or overpowering, that enables them to make some sense of their suffering and their failures, because we all have that. You know, we're all, fail, we're all failures on one level, but we all have the possibility of being redeemed. Well, we are redeemed, but we have the possibility of living up to that redemption. By, by reforming our lives. So 
I don't know, I'm kind of wandering, but I hope that I help, hope that helped a little bit. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I am a doctoral student right now at a secular university, and I've been in academia um, prior to the DMA for two masters and a graduate diploma. So I've been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I've seen the culture shift so radically. Yeah. One of the things that brought me into the church was gender ideology, because I saw it ousted upon all of my community, everybody had to bend the knee to it. It's still a thing. I work for an institution where I at least, I have to have a semblance of bending the knee to it as well mm -hmm. if I don't want to get fired. And um, I see the damage that it does to people. I have a student who is identifying that way and I see the incredible damage to his life, to his body, to his mind. And as a, as a believer, and as somebody, even before I really became devout, I knew how harmful it was. I just, it, I just knew it. I could see it on mm -hmm. people. And one of the things that really is so difficult, not just knowing that it's wrong, but also knowing why, you know, on a deeply mm -hmm. spiritual level, why this is, like you said, it's soul murdering. So I wanted to say thank you for saying that, because for me, it's very, it's a relief to hear somebody say that. You know, you say, right, do you want to do an academic track? Uh, professionally, do you want to be an mm -hmm. academic? Okay. It's very important, and the Archbishop said this in one of his books. You know, we have to be courageous. We also have to be prudent. And yes. so you don't go looking to be a martyr. You know, yeah. it, that's very appropriate. You want, to be, you want to be able to survive, maintain your views, and get into a position where you're, where you have a, you know, tenure, and it's almost impossible to get rid of you, you know? And, 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 and that's when you can be, you know, a little bit bolder. Uh, I, you know, I, what I do is I always pray for uh, uh, not being put into a position where I would betray things, you know, because I, I can never be completely confident in my own courage. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you'll know when you have to say something but you don't go looking for it, you know. Um, that would be my advice. That'd certainly be the archbishop's advice. You know, and he was a tough customer. I mean, he had a lot of courage, but he wasn't stupid. He was very prudent. He chose his fights very, very carefully. I don't know if that's helpful, but but. No, that is helpful. In fact, my own bishop has told me the same thing, <laughs> and I agree. I, I agree. You don't go looking Good. for fights, but sometimes the fights come to you, and yep. unfortunately, you have to stand up. And like, for example, I've had to leave two jobs for wow. that very thing. But now I'm in a situation where it, it really is my future. It's not yeah. just a job. Yeah. So it's, it, it's spiritual warfare. It's really difficult, especially because when you see the people in front of you who are suffering and, and yet everybody around you is basically pushing them off the cliff into the, the destruction. You know what would make really good reading? I'm, you may have already read it, but I, I made reference to that fabulous essay by Václav Havel, The Power of the Powerless. That is really mandatory reading. Now, Havel was, I think he was baptized Catholic, but he never practiced. He was a very secular guy. But uh, he had friends that were very Catholic in the, in the dissident movement. And um, that particular piece can be taught just as easily in a Catholic college as it can be anywhere else. You know, I mean, it, it, it talks about the need for courage and this, the need simply to not lie, you know? Uh, the name again, Václav the Havel. Power of the, the Power of the Powerless Thank by you. Václav Havel, H-A-V-E-L. My name is uh, Bobby Delaney. I teach at an all-girls uh, Catholic high school in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, and teaching eighth graders, just a lot of what you said kind of uh, was my experience like dealing with them. Um, but I wanted to ask, you mentioned that a heroic and beautiful life is necessary to bring Catholics back to the church, specifically young Catholics. Um, what are the things based upon your research, the people you've interviewed, uh, that's being done uh, that are effective and can be replicated in like my classroom uh, to help attract people. You need to. to I, I couldn't answer that okay. because I don't remember what they said. Okay. You know, but but I'm not trying to be evasive either. My my 
My wife was a teacher for 40 years in Catholic schools, and she specialized in seventh and eighth grade. You know, it's a very difficult time, especially for girls. Mm -hmm. And and uh, boys are much more manageable. But uh, I wish I could answer. If you give me your email, I I'll, I'll, I'll get some information for you, okay? Because there are ways to reach these people. Mainly it's just uh, being an attractive mentor to them. It has a huge amount of influence, you know, I mean, uh, that's certainly what my wife tried to do, and she was a pretty darn good teacher. So, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned the implicit clericalism of blaming the problems in the church on bishops or on the mm -hmm. clergy. I'm wondering if you could speak some for your, from your experience having worked uh, as a layperson very closely with an archbishop um, as to the, the role or possibility of instilling a sense of agency um, for personal discipleship and evangelization within the church among the laity while still maintaining a healthy emphasis on and respect for the ordained clergy and for our leadership. That, there, there's a genius to it, you know. You can't just say, we have a lay, pro lay program that's going to develop lay leaders. I mean, you have to have somebody who really belly feels it. That's a good Orwellian term, but, you know, really really has it in their gut about being a disciple. And, you know, Curtis Martin is a classic example. Tim Gray, classical, Ted Shree. Um, these are the guys that um, really know how to do it very well. So if you put up, if you get a program like that together, you have to get those guys involved in some sense in providing uh, counsel. Sitting right next to you is Sean Enners, who is part of our fellowship in, in Denver. And um, he can probably answer that as well as anybody because he's a superb layman who's worked with uh, the clergy for his, virtually his entire career exceptionally well, and he's highly respected by Archbishop Shapu. There's no... So much of this has to do with personality and openness, you know. I mean, there, there is a there is a among bishops a, a nervousness to open up to lay people as as assistants because, you know, so many lay people don't don't really understand the specific um, relationship that priests and bishops have, the particular vulnerabilities that priests have. Priests are in a really tough situation right now because um, a lot of them feel this is a I interviewed a lot of priests for this. And there's um, a fundamental loyalty, but also a real anxiety about being sold down the river. And that has to do with, you know, this kind of draconian response to the clergy abuse crisis, which I, I think was finally the right way to go. And I think Shap, you thought it was finally the right way to go, but it was always the conversations that we had about priests who were, who had allegations made again against them were very, very painful because Priests are supposed to have rights. And in the abuse crisis, all that goes right out the window. You know? But you asked a question about forming lay people. And um, I, think, I think the way to do that is to have a program where you get people like Sean and myself and Ted and other people to just say, here's my experience, learn from it. Um, we have a, a program, we, we have a program in Philadelphia that does try to do this. I've been out of the diocese now for three years, so I don't really have a sense of how effective that is, but the effort's being made. Um, the heart of the matter is, how do you cultivate a legitimate fidelity and at the same time not turn off your brain, you know? And, and that's why I listed this history of conflict in the church. That's standard operating procedure. You know, Pope John the Twelfth was a murderer and a sexual profligate. Does that um, does that mean the papacy is a fraud? No, of course not. It meant it meant he was a bad pope, and we've had more than one. So it's perfectly legitimate to raise questions, for example, about the current pope or the last pope, because uh, we're responsible adults and we're co-responsible for the church. But we still have to have this kind of instinctive sense of respect for the respect for the priesthood, and respect for our own lay vocation without the two clashing, you know? I mean, 
being a lector is a beautiful thing, but that's not necessarily the lay apostolate. You know, we're supposed to be in the world. You know, I, I wish I could be more specific about answering your question, but I, I, I just, for me, um, like I have never called the archbishop by his first name. It was just inconceivable to me, you know? I have priests that I, I, I'm very familiar with that I will do that, I, and two or three bishops that are very close friends that I do that with. But respect for the distance is something that has to be, you just have to belly feel that, that um, we have different places in the church and, and respect the difference, but also seek out a legitimate kind of friendship with the, with the clergy. I'm not being very specific here. I, I'm sorry, I wish I could be more direct. Hi, Sean Gower. I'm a PhD candidate in music history at the University of Pennsylvania. Great, um, don't write bad music, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, you referenced history being the memory of a people, mm -hmm. and I'm struck by how in secular, many secular universities and amongst the secular intelligentsia, there's a lot of confusion in this current moment about what history even is. Um, if, you know, being at the American Historical Association, just debate about what methodologies count for history, about what focuses should be the driving uh, force behind historical research. Um, we kind of see a lot of those things come up in the controversy about the 1619 project, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered how you would define a Catholic approach to history and memory and uh, how can that approach be enriching to us both on a personal and a societal level? Okay, the place you have to begin is in the authenticity and reliability of scripture. Because if you believe in that, that's the, that's the, the, the core, um, what's the right word that I'm looking for? I mean, that's the thread that goes through Catholic experience, okay? the reliability and the credibility of, 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 say, of, the, of the Word of God. That's what makes Catholic history not simply um, an exercise in power. And you know, that's the whole Marx, neo-Marxist thing, is that all, all, um, all narratives are basically power narratives of the ruling elite, you know? And, and so all history is simply falsified or falsifiable because it's simply the story the elite tells everybody else to keep themselves in power. And that's really kind of dominant in academic circles now. But if you're a Christian, you always come back to the Word of God. And, uh, and that kind of anchors the story through generations. Anyway, that's the way that I would look at it, that, that um, we're in a really dangerous time. And believe me, it's, this isn't just a Christian way of looking at it. I mean, Christopher Lash, for heaven's sakes, made this point repeatedly, and, and he was not even a religious believer, that social science is a new clergy it's the new source of revealed knowledge, okay? And when social science disagrees in terms of what a person is and how a person finds authenticity, when that disagrees with sacred scripture, scripture's right, I believe, and social science is simply a power tool of a certain kind of an elite. It's not a very good answer either, but that's how I look at things. I rely on the word of God, you know, and, and uh, I'm not a literalist, I'm not a, you know, a, a, a fundamentalist, but I believe that that's true revelation of the Word of God. And um, everything that has happened in, in Christian history always comes back to the authenticity of that revelation. So the history has an organic whole, even though, you know, it goes through all sorts of different experiences over time uh, that, that keeps, it, keeps the community together and becomes the memory of the community. Does that make any sense? There's something else that I wanted to say about, you know, I, I, wanted, I want to share this with you. I don't want to forget this tonight. But we had an attorney in Philadelphia, terrific civil attorney, one of our outside attorneys that we used regularly. He was a really good Christian. He was a fallen away cat. He, he was a Catholic who left during the weirdness of the six, 70s, you know. But he was a very good evangelical Christian. And he asked me once, did I read, the, did I read scripture? And my answer, of course, was, sure, I read scripture. You know, we hear it every Sunday. I've read, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I've read a lot about it. I've read letters of St. Paul. 
He said, no, friend, that's not what I'm saying. Have you read it from the first verse of Matthew to the last verse of Revelation? And why don't you try that? So what I started doing three or four times a week was just to go to our adoration chapel very early in the morning before Eucharist was exposed, reading three chapters of scripture, 15 minutes of prayer. And I've now done that, I've been through the New Testament probably three times over the last couple of years, maybe more. But it's had a huge impact on my life. And I see what evangelicals mean when they say, read the word of God. They really mean, read it. Because every time you go through it, you find out something different. Some other element of truth comes through to you. But it's the organic whole of the New Testament experience that's so powerful. Uh, and I really recommend it to people, however you can incorporate that into your lives. It really has made a difference. I'm not a pious person. My wife has that, got that corner on the market, you know. But, but um, I mean, I, I grew up and I was, I was formed to be, a, be rationally oriented, you know. I, it's not that Catholics are not rational, but I mean, I, it's, it's, maybe it's the German in me or something. I just, I just, um, I don't go down that pious road the way that my wife does, but, but she's Irish, she's excusable, you know. <laughs> but I, I have to say that, that, that I think and act a little bit differently because of that, that discipline. And that came from a, you know, a guy that used to be Catholic. Thank you for being here. I've really appreciated a lot of what you said. I have a question following up on what you said about this perspective of priests feeling a fundamental loyalty towards their bishop, but also this fear of getting sold down the river. Mm -hmm. And so my question is twofold. One is, what can we as the laity do to help them within this tension in their lives? And then, I don't know if you can speak to this or not, but mm -hmm. if you have ideas, what could be the role of canon law in that situation also? No, I'm not the guy to ask that. Okay. I mean, a guy like Bishop Paprocki would be the guy to ask on the canon, canon law side. But, uh, you know, this pontificate is real loose with law. That's just a fact. You know, I mean, it's not, uh, they don't operate um, comfortably within canon law. And that's not me speaking, that's a bunch of ca canon attorneys that have told me that, you know. Um, so that lawlessness in the current pontificate is not a good thing. In terms of um, what we can do, I mean, priests are people, they want to be loved. They want to be respected, you know, and and um, they, they, they typically respond to people who obviously show their respect without being intrusive on their lives unnecessarily. Uh, and man, they, they, that's another job you just don't want, you know. They do, I mean, if you're, if you're called to the vocation, it's a great job. Chap, you said this repeatedly, you know, that, it, that he never felt unhappy doing his work. There were days of real tension and, you know, suffering. I suspect every priest in this room would say something like that, but if you're called to it, joy, as in a good marriage, makes the suffering worth it. But they, everybody needs to be told, hey, you're doing a good job. I respect you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. And that really, I think, helps to make a difference. Um, I just, I, I, one thing I also want to say, too, and, and this is kind of an obvious thing, and everybody in the room will know it, but, you know, when we moved to Philadelphia, um, we moved to a parish that was way up north in the, in the diocese and should have been a very successful parish. Uh, but it was dying. And it was dying because the pastor had been heavily traumatized during the uh, clergy abuse scandal. He hadn't been accused of anything, but he had been in a position of authority and, and it really damaged him. And, um, and so he was very formal and very distant. And uh, people were just put off by that. He's a good guy too, he's a wonderful man. So we get a new pastor, uh, some guy in mid-career, you know, one of seven kids. In two years, he radically turned the parish around, not by doing anything dramatic, but just by being present to the people, doing the little things around the parish that indicated to the people that they, hey, this guy means, some, means something to us, and he's giving life back to the parish. During COVID, our donations went up, you know, and they stayed up. And it's because of the pastor. 
which just underlines one of the most basic things about Catholic life. If you have a strong pastor, you're going to have a strong parish. But those guys need to be supported. They need to be thanked. Uh, hello. Thank you for taking the time to come and speak at Benedictine tonight. Uh, my name is John Paul Beer. I'm a freshman philosophy major here at Benedictine. And you, in your remarks, talked about how about 30% of the population of Generation Z mm -hmm. believes in any kind of religion. Um, and that's 30% of my generation, so that's an issue that's very close to home for me. And increasingly, even here at Benedictine, I've met with people, I engage with people who are loose Catholics, who engage in morally destructive behavior that I want to call out, but my only avenues of doing that would be through uh, conversations and ideas that I might discuss with someone in this room, not someone who's fallen away from their faith, who mm -hmm. doesn't see going to church as a priority or following any of its moral uh, beliefs, especially the, uh, the theology of the body. So I guess my question then becomes, how do people my age meaningfully connect with people who are in that situation without coming off as attacking them? Um, just, boy, in one sense, you can't. Be, uh, but, but I think that if you were able to develop a friendship in some way with them, that that might be of, that might be of help. I mean, all you can do is what you can do. I mean, not, what doesn't work is hectoring people into believing. That just doesn't work. You know, the raw material of the people you describe is uh, the base clay. And uh, hopefully over the four-year four -year period that you're here, some of this influence will shape the clay in the right direction. But you just have to be who you are and if there are opportunities to invite them to things that you think would be helpful to them or just invite them into a friendship with yourself that, that where they can draw from your personality and your witness, over time that makes a difference. You know, That's about the best thing that I can express. You know, we Americans have this idea that uh, we're fixers, you know? We wanna fix everything. And we wanna do it like right now or yesterday even better. And, and um, Converting a culture and converting a soul is not overnight, or rarely overnight. You know, it's it's a long war, and you just have to be prepared to persist. My grandfather was one of the nastiest men in the world, and he lived with us. And uh, he had been a Catholic, and then he had cheated on his wife when she had cancer and died. And um, and he lived with us, and he was just a he just treated my mother terribly, but my mother never stopped praying for him, never stopped giving him um, uh, expressions of, of love to the degree that she could. And before he died, he came back to the church. She won. You know, it took her 10 years, but she beat him. And, and, and she just wore him down. And, and uh, sometimes it takes that long. Now, you don't have 10 years. You're here four years, and then you're out, you know? but. You take it slow and you try to befriend people and show them good in yourself and the good in this place, maybe that'll make a difference for them. I'm not surprised, by the way, that there's people at places like Benedictine that um, think the whole thing is a fraud. They're all over the place. But you know, the opposite is also true. The people who want to believe in something are also all over the place. And we have to get, we have to identify them and bring them back to the, or sensitize them and bring them in to the degree that we can, which means we have to be missionaries, which none of us think like. You know, I mean, Americans don't think like that. We, you know, it's embarrassing or uncool or um, a, a violation of um, appropriate public behavior to try to bring someone into the church. You know, the evangelicals are not afflicted with that disease, but we need to contract it. Okay, we have time for one more. Hello. Um, thank you for being here today. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, as a young American in today's world, it's, um, I feel a lot of what you've been talking about tonight, it's very hard to be, um, very hard to be Christian 
and I'm new to being Catholic. I just last Easter vigil I became, I got baptized. Um, one of the biggest things I've good for had, you. God bless you. Thank you. Um, in these days, I've had a hard time loving my enemies, and oh, gee, I, it's easy for me, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I particularly like all those guys at the National Catholic Reporter. <laughs> but continue. I'm sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> My biggest question is how do we combat hatred that we face from strangers, friends, and even family? Because once um, a man I greatly respected, a personal friend of my dad, he was essentially my uncle. One day he just posted on Facebook that he believed all Trump supporters shouldn't be allowed to live. That included my entire family. <laughs> yeah. And it was very hard to not be upset about that. To well, you should be upset about him. it. That's very wrong behavior. But how are you going to react to it? You know, does, it, does the anger, I'll talk about anger in a minute. I mean, the, it's appropriate for you to say, look, you know, you're blood and you're telling me that I don't have a right to live. I mean, that, you know, uncle, that's not a way, of pro way to, way, forget about Christianity. That's not a civil way to operate under any circumstances. You can't say stuff like that without it leaving a mark on people who are completely innocent. And you're making com completion, conclusions about people that you don't know. I mean, I think you can do that, and I think you should do that, because they, they do need to be confronted, but you have to somehow keep the anger throttled back in, in doing it. And that, man, that's really hard. You know, I've given talks before about, <laughs> this is another experience, excuse me for saying this, but I mean, it may, it may help you a bit. You know, I, I made the mistake some years ago of asking my wife what my key sin was. <laughs> and I was getting ready for confession, and I always thought it was like vanity, you know, pride. Because pride is very easy to have and hide. You can push it way down so nobody sees it, but it really is right there, you know. And she looked at me and said, you're out of your mind. You have an anger problem. And I thought about it. And I, I, honestly, it's true. I'm angry most of the time. And, and why am I angry? There's no logical reason for it. I have a fantastic wife. I've got four kids. All of them are great. I've got 11 grandkids. I've had a fabulous career. You know. So instead of thinking about that, I think about that idiot in the White House, you know, or, or um, the National Catholic Reporter, that's a favorite topic, you know, and, 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 and that, but here's the point, I mean, if you do that, it, it, no matter how legitimate it is at the beginning, it becomes this infection that just eats you alive. And that's what your uncle is doing. He's allowing his anger to eat him alive, and you can't be infected by that. It's appropriate to call him out, but you have to keep that, you have to keep that infection out of your heart because it will, it will kill you. I mean, um, and it's hard. I mean, believe me, that's that's really hard for me because there's so many things to be angry about. <laughs> you know? Thank you. Uh, hey, you've been a great audience. Thank you.